you all for coming today to this critical conversation public keynote lecture that we have organized. This is part of our annual series of critical conversations, and this is the fifth in that series. Uh, and this year it is on the topic of climate smart agricultural practices and resilience in the Midwest. My name is Madhu Khanna. I am the Alvin H. Baum Family Chair and Director of the Institute for Sustainability, Energy, and Environment at the University of Illinois, and also Professor in Agriculture and Consumer Economics in the Department of Agriculture and Consumer Economics at the University. We are really excited to be here uh, this year, and particularly to be uh, hosting this critical conversation on this important topic. Uh, this event has been made possible with generous support from the Alvin H. Baum Family Fund, and I'm really pleased that Joel Friedman and Loretta Namovich, who uh, lead that fund, are here today with us. The public keynote lecture today is going to kick off a day-long uh, workshop tomorrow, which is on this uh, topic of uh, uh, climate smart agriculture and enable us to go more in depth to hear different perspectives. And it's really our pleasure today to be having a keynote speaker who's going to be able to lead us into that discussion. Before we start, I would like to read our land acknowledgement from our university. As a land-grant institution, our campus has a responsibility to acknowledge the historical context in which it exists. We are currently on the lands of the Peoria, the Kaskaskia, Piankasha, Wea, Miami, Maskutin, Odawa, Salk, Meskwaki, Kickapoo, Potawatomi, Ojibwe, and Chickasaw nations. It is necessary for us to acknowledge these native nations and for us to work with them as we move forward as an institution with Native people at the core of our efforts. Before we get to our keynote speaker, I would like to invite Chancellor Robert Jones to deliver a few opening remarks. Chancellor Jones is a chancellor at the University of Illinois campus in Urbana-Champaign. He's a crop physiologist with expertise in agronomy and plant genetics with decades of research on the Midwest. He knows very well about the effects of climate change and what it might mean to future generations and he's keenly aware of the need for climate smart agricultural practices to help us feed and power these future generations. He's passionate about the environment and chairs the Sustainability Council at the University of Illinois that charts the path to make our campus carbon neutral as soon as possible and to make it a model of sustainability. We're really pleased to welcome him to give some opening remarks. Chancellor Jones. Well, let me start by saying good afternoon or good evening, whichever is appropriate. I've run around so much, I'm not sure what time of day it is sometimes. But let me start by saying thank you to Professor Kana for the invitation to basically just say a few words of welcome to you before you hear from our keynote speaker that I just had a pleasure to meet a few moments ago, and I look forward to your comments as well. But as Professor Connor said, I think it be, we can't thank these folks enough, so I'm going to say it again. A thank you to the Alvin H. Baum Family Fund and Joel and Loretta. Thank you so much for your unwavering support of this series of conversation and for ISEEK in general. And I just ask you to join me in giving them a round of applause of gratitude for all that they do. So I think, as uh, Madhu said, uh, it probably goes without saying, uh, the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign is extremely pleased and very proud to be the host of another installation in the series of conversations here in the city of Chicago about my favorite topic, and that is anything related to agriculture. And uh, this conversation needs to be held in every city of every size and across this great nation if we are to be prepared and if we can need to step up our game in being prepared to have more resilience than perhaps I think we are prepared for now in response to global climate change. And so it is very, very important and particularly important to me that 
uh, and very exciting that we're bringing experts from campus uh, in climate smart agriculture and we, we're going to be focusing on resiliency and it's so proud to be here along all, with all the other stakeholders from across the agriculture supply chain as well as farmers and intermediate producers, food distributors, consumers, as well as government, uh, industry and government and non-government agencies. Um, this is very, very critically important and I think very timely. Because as Professor Connor said, I spent 34 and a half years of my life dedicated to the fundamental issue of how w can we make sure that important agricultural crops and my focus was on cereal crops or grain crops. And doing the baseline research that basically would help us understand what are the underlying physiological and biological mechanisms that are going to be disrupted in response to what we called at the time heat stress because this was so many decades ago, climate change hadn't even been corn back in those days 10, 30 years ago. But so it, this is particularly important to me to be here to bring some words of welcome to you. And uh, we are very, very pleased that this is a week that is uh, just replete with a lot of conversations about climate and climate change. And I'm very pleased that we're hosting a conversation here in Chicago. I just returned late last night from New York City where I had the opportunity to participate and the UN General Assembly reception that was to kick off the Climate Week, thanks to the generosity of one of our dear friends and colleagues, and I think most of you know Richard and Claudia uh, Elderman, and they hosted this event, and I can tell you, it was very, very gratifying to be around so many people from different backgrounds who are all very much acutely aware and there to participate in this conversation not only just to continue to study and analyze and report the impact of climate change, we have to focus more on resiliency. And that is where our focus needs to reside. And I can tell you, um, we are very, very pleased to, to uh, have representation in this room tonight from USDA, the Nature Conservancy, the Illinois Soybean Association, the American Farmland Trust, Sustainable Capital Advisors, John Deere, and of course the Environmental Defense Fund uh, represented by tonight's speaker and a host of other folks whose affiliation I didn't mention. We're glad to have you here. And I'm so happy about this because for quite some time it's been very, very clear to me and I'm clear, sure it's clear to each of you in the room that we believe that those of us in the Midwest, I think fundamentally believe that What's very, very important for us to focus on, the most important thing for us to focus on is the importance of understanding the impact that global climate change can have on the, this massive agriculture production center we call the Midwest. And I, with the exception of four years that I spent as the president of SUNY Albany, my whole career, as soon as they let me out of the state of Georgia and Missouri for a graduate study. I've been, I guess Missouri is kind of Midwest. I guess you can, we can debate that. <laughs> but uh, I spent my whole life, is my point, in the Midwest. And I know the fundamental value of how critically important the Midwest is to our ability to be resilient as it relates to food production and continue to be able to feed not only ourselves, but other parts of the world. A lot of that runs through the Midwest and I'm very, very pleased that a lot of it runs through my university, the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign. The ag tech sector, and particularly the ag tech sector in response to climate change and other kind of environmental issues, is one of the fastest growing sectors at our university. And we're just very, very pleased that we have gathered together to continue this series of conversations and I can tell you, we have good examples at our university that we take this very seriously. And I think we're positioned uniquely to have inroads in this regard because we already have major research programs like the Illinois Regenerative Agriculture Initiative, the Agro Ecosystem Sustainability Center, 
the Agricultural Policy and Design Laboratory. And I remind you, we have the only USDA farm of the future in the entire nation. So if there's anybody positioned to participate with all of you to drive this critically important issue, because folks, if we don't get this right, a lot of the other stuff that we learn, lose sleep over, we argue and debate over, is not going to matter that much. And I don't think that's an overstatement. So with that, let me just say again, thank you for allowing me to be here. And we look forward to hearing our keynote speaker and participating in a dialogue and conversation. Thank you so much. So with that, let me uh, introduce our keynote speaker. Um, Maggie is the Senior Director for Climate Smart Agriculture, Finance and Markets at the Environmental Defense Fund. She works with agricultural, financial institutions, food and agricultural companies, land grant universities, farmers and other stakeholders to create an agricultural system that generates climate stability and secure farmer livelihoods. Her work at EDF helps to quantify the farm financial impacts of climate smart practice adoption. She collaborates with major financial institutions and food companies to develop financial products and other solutions and identifies policy solutions to facilitate investment and risk management that supports climate smart agriculture. Maggie has testified to Congress on the role of agriculture finance in reducing climate related financial risk and serves as a co-chair of Field to Markets Innovative Finance Committee. She began working with EDF in 2011. She holds a master's degree in environmental management with a focus on economics from Duke University and a bachelor's in economics and political science from Tufts University. Maggie's talk today titled Climate Smart Agriculture, Overcoming Barriers and Financing the Transition will get us thinking about the ways in which agriculture can contribute to reducing greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. She brings a practical perspective to this topic by thinking about issues that include incentives we need to provide for more adoption of climate smart agriculture, how to pay for making this transition, and other barriers that need, need to be overcome. Uh, please join me in welcoming Maggie to open our critical conversation with her keynote. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I am sincerely humbled by um, the efforts of the organizing committee, um, all of you here tonight, um, many friends, uh, many folks that I've just been fans of for many years and I'm excited to talk tomorrow. Um, and yes, I'm really looking forward to our conversation tomorrow, so I hope that this gets us off to a good start and I can't wait to hear um, what all of you think uh, when we really get into it um, tomorrow. So right now, we are in a moment for climate smart agriculture. We have dramatically increased engagement by the agriculture sector on the need to act on climate. And we have unprecedented levels of public and private investment in solutions. This moment is being driven not only by research and advocacy, but by farmers' own experiences with climate change. There was a recent New York Times article on the weather whiplash that's been experienced by farmers across the country, including wheat farmers in Kansas, who um, this year had drought, and then finally rain, but too late and at the wrong time. Um, in California, years of drought washed away by massive flooding. In Nebraska, a brief period of extreme humidity and high temperatures that led to widespread cattle deaths. And in Georgia, a warm winter followed by hard freezes in March that wiped out most of the state's peach crop. I've seen the devastation of extreme weather fueled by climate change firsthand. This is Joe Stilley. He farms just outside of New Bern, North Carolina, alongside the Trent River. And I visited him in the aftermath of Hurricane Florence, which uh, we just had the fifth anniversary of, of Hurricane Florence. Um, Joe, this, this field that he's standing in, um, 
was just muddy sticks, um, which days before had been, you know, beautiful, fluffy cotton ready to harvest. And he was really hit by a double whammy. Um, first, uh, there was the storm surge caused by the hurricane that moved water up the river and flooded his field. Then the rain that fell um, upstream in the Piedmont region where I live uh, ran down the rivers and flooded him again. Um, so that obviously was a total loss, that crop. And when he was standing there, he was saying, you know, it was just so beautiful. It was such a beautiful crop. Um, and Hurricane Florence came, uh, was a thousand year storm. Uh, it came just two years after Hurricane Matthew, a 500 year storm. So, you know, let's be clear. These are not singular events, but rather a pattern of increasing disruption that will affect what goes on your plate how much is available, and what it costs. Studies have found that climate change has already reduced global agricultural productivity by at least 20%, and that will continue if we don't change course. Um, studies have also shown um, these projections so that yields of major grain crops are projected to decline by 20% by 2050. Um, and 50% or more by the end of the century. Now, my scientists tell me these are actually underestimates because most of these are based on averages rather than the disruptions and the extremes. Um, so this is a very grave situation that we're facing. At the same time, agriculture is also a significant contributor to climate change. Um, Agriculture and associated land use changes emit about a third of greenhouse gas emissions globally um, and disproportionate amounts of the highly potent greenhouse gases. Um, so this is really important. Half of methane emissions, two thirds of nitrous oxide emissions. These are the emissions that are really driving warming right now. And these are the emissions of the gases that we need to get down now if we're gonna have a chance to put in place the changes that we need to take down carbon dioxide over the long term. So it's really important that we focus especially on these most potent greenhouse gases, and agriculture is an essential part of that. This study was completed by um, some of my colleagues, and they found that global food systems could add nearly a degree to global warming um, by the end of the century. Um, just think about that for a moment. We can fix energy, we can fix transportation. If we don't do anything about agriculture, we are still gonna have a serious problem with our climate. So, um, now that I've terrified you all, um, what do we do about that? Climate smart agriculture. Um, there are two things essentially that the agriculture sector needs to do at the same time. One, we need to bring down emissions, um, avoid additional emissions and sequester carbon. And two, we need to build resilience to the climate impacts that farmers are already experiencing. So what does that look like? Um, some of the top opportunities to reduce greenhouse gas emissions include bringing down those um, potent emissions that I just talked about from fertilizer use, um, from methane, both from manure management and also um, really bringing to scale enteric methane solutions for cattle. Um, cutting carbon dioxide emissions from land use changes, and increasing carbon storage as well. On the other hand, as we try to build resilience, um, diversifying agricultural systems is gonna be really important where in places where they're um, mostly monoculture, improving soil health, the sponginess of the soil so that it can take up more moisture um, and also hold on to it longer. Managing water effectively, whether you're in a place that's losing its water or a place that's getting way too much and way too often, that water management is gonna be essential. And last, really accelerating our research and development to um, figure out what farmers are going to need to do to adapt. The last, um, you know, I hear a lot, like farmers have always been adapting to, to weather and climate change, and that's true, that's true. Um, but the, the last national climate assessment um, showed that while farmers are adapting, the adaptation is not keeping up with the pace of change. So we really need to figure out some ways to support them in that adaptation to help it happen quicker, um, allow them to um, build their resilience 
uh, in a way where they're really supported along that pathway. So let's just pause. Those sound like, you know, a lot of good things. Why aren't they already happening? Um, or why aren't they happening at the scale that's needed? Some of these practices we know really well. We were talking about this at lunch today. We've been advocating for efficient nitrogen use, for no-till, for cover crops for years. These are very well-known practices. This is not anything new to a farmer. And yet there are still barriers to farmers doing them. Those include um, things like, you know, costs, either upfront cost or ongoing cost, risk, any change requires some amount of risk. Um, technical assistance, boots on the ground, who's going to help farmers get through that risk and to the other side. Operations and logistics, like how is this going to work on my farm, um, and especially how that affects labor, which is a concern on many farms already. So if our conservation practices make labor issues worse, um, that's a problem. Um, the landowner renter dynamic, you know, where a farmer doesn't own their land, figuring out ways to still incentivize them to manage it for the long term. Um, and social and cultural factors, right? Like nobody wants their neighbors to think that they're weird. Like, you know, that's, that's just a universal thing. That's for the practices that we've been working on forever. <laughs> now, when we talk about things like radical crop diversification, introducing perennial costs, that becomes a markets issue, an infrastructure issue. So there's no shortage of uh, problems for the smart people in this room to solve. Um, to add another layer, these barriers are heightened for historically underserved farmers um, and for farmers of color, they're interwoven with the history of discrimination around access to land and access to credit, which just increases the barriers um, to those farmers. I had the privilege of attending um, a farmer roundtable put together by the Federation of Southern Cooperatives with uh, a group of black farmers in Georgia who'd been experiencing trouble in accessing credit. Um, and we were talking with them both about access to credit and about climate change. And the farmers in that room said, yeah, climate change is making farming harder. Extreme weather just adds to my list of problems. But I can't really think about that right now. Like, I'm just trying to hang on to my land. And so we need to find ways to address those needs in conjunction with also advancing climate smart agriculture. At the end of the day, it's a systems change issue, right? Um, and we're incredibly fortunate to have experts in the room tomorrow who know different parts of that system really well and what it's gonna take to change them. My work at EDF is largely focused on economics and finance, so I'm gonna focus on that largely in this talk, but I'm really excited tomorrow to hear from the social scientists, to hear from the folks working on the ground with farmers, to hear from the policy people and really bring all of that together. So through my work at EDF, um, we've identified three ingredients that we think are critical to this change to advance in climate smart agriculture. Um, I'm going to talk through some of our work and the trends that we're seeing across these three themes. So there are lots of topics where, you know, more information, data, and research is needed, but I want to focus in on the importance of economic information for producers on climate smart agricultural practices. And we have Ryan Heinegger here, whose organization produced this survey um, that found that 61% of farmers who have not adopted cover crops, so this survey was of non-adopters, report that information on economic returns would help address their concerns. Now, this is something that we've heard from our own farmer advisors. EDF has a farmer advisory group, many of whom have been with us for 10 years or more. Um, and we consider them some of our most important strategic advisors. I was just on one of their farms um, a couple of weeks ago in Idaho, checking out just some awesome crop diversification stuff that I'm excited to, to share with you all later. Um, and these farmers in this group are very committed to conservation, and they're also very business savvy. 
So when they came to us maybe six or seven years ago and said, you know, we really wish that we had better information on the impacts of our climate smart conservation practices on our budgets, I was like, huh, if they don't understand this, like if they're not seeing how those practices are translating through their cash flow into their bottom line, then probably most farmers do not. And this is a much bigger problem. So this kind of essential insight became the foundation of a lot of our work on un to understand the financial impacts of climate smart practices. Um, and since that time, we've really expanded this work across the country, um, collaborating with farmers directly, agricultural organizations, ag accountants, getting in there, doing the books. Um, and, um, and especially land-grant universities. Um, so this graph shows um, where some of those analyses have happened. Um, and we found that it's really important to work with land-grant universities collaboratively. Um, we found that, you know, one, they're trusted by farmers. Um, two, they're trusted by other kind of important and interested parties like agricultural lenders. Um, they also have some really great sources of data. So one of these projects has been collaborating with the University of Minnesota, um, which hosts the FinBin financial database. Um, and so they have the largest publicly available farm financial database in the country. Um, they already had um, field, data fields on tillage practices, on cropping practices, but they didn't have cover crops in there. So we worked with them to integrate cover crop financial information into this database. And we're getting all kinds of new insights at a scale that we haven't been able to before. Um, oh, I also wanted to go back to this one real quick. So in Illinois, I, I caught this right before my presentation, Laura Gentry. I was like, it looks like we're not doing anything in Illinois. But that's because PCM is there, and they're so awesome. <laughs> so Precision Conservation Management um, in Illinois is a fabulous program that does similar work, working directly with farmers, understanding the farm financial impacts of different conservation practices, sharing that information back out with them. They're a fabulous partner to us. We're also collaborating with the Intertribal Agriculture Council. Um, this is more of a case study project where we're trying to assess the financial impacts of regenerative grazing systems on native ranches. And this, the goal of this is both to inform native producers themselves and also inform um, those who are lending to them um, and help them understand how those investments in climate smart agriculture are gonna pay off over the long term. So this information obviously is important to producers, right? How are we gonna ask a producer to do something new if we don't know what it's gonna cost them and we don't know what the benefits are gonna be over time? I mean, that's just like table stakes. But then it's also really important for all these other audiences um, who are trying to support farmers to adopt these practices. So both public and private financial incentives need to be informed by this work. Otherwise, you know, we're just kind of shooting in the dark. Um, we're not targeting our financial solutions to the problem that we're trying to solve. Um, and so, you know, this of course is, you know, important for anybody developing financial solutions, but especially at this moment in time, um, when more money is going into climate smart agriculture than ever has before in history. Um, so this is a snapshot of the public investment in climate smart agriculture. The Inflation Reduction Act um, added $20 billion to USDA conservation <coughs> programs. It's just truly unprecedented. Um, and we're working really hard in the farm bill negotiations to make sure that that money is protected. <coughs> in addition to that, the administration created the Partnerships for Climate Smart Commodities program which added another three billion into partnership product projects that are linking financial incentives for producers to climate smart commodity markets to measurement and verification. So here are some of those kind of private sector 
um, investment pieces that are evolving and that we're working to align with support for climate smart agriculture. Um, we've got our farmers in the middle, cute little girl pigtails. Um, so we're working a lot with agricultural lenders to align their financing with the needs of producers and the transition to climate smart agriculture and also to recognize the long-term risk reduction and value generated by farmers who adopt these practices. We're working on crop insurance to integrate the risk reduction value of climate smart ag. And this is not just an ag insurance thing, like this is a movement that's going on across all insurance types around the world. You know, climate risk and insurance, they've got a lot of things to figure out. Um, we're working with the supply chain, um, many of whom are setting goals to reduce emissions um, and creating incentives to, um, for farmers to farm uh, you know, in a way that helps them achieve those goals. And then, you know, there's also been a growth of environmental markets, especially in the carbon space, um, that farmers can, you know, consider participating in. And we're really working to make sure that those are square with the science and also feasible for farmers, really, to, to reckon with and participate in fairly. So going through those a bit, you know, when I began working at EDF, um, Walmart was just setting its first greenhouse gas reduction goal. Um, and agriculture was a big part of their missions. And we were talking about supply chain sustainability and everybody was like, no, no, supply chains are a black box. That's impossible. Well, you know, 10-ish or so years later, half of the top 100 food and beverage companies around, around the world have measured, disclosed, and set goals to reduce emissions throughout their supply chains. That's a massive change. And no, these programs aren't perfect. And no, they're not all hitting the ground in a perfect way. But real money is being invested in farmers through projects in this country and around the world. And that is a shift that can't be denied. Similarly, this is some University of Illinois research um, Bruce Sherrick participated in this. Um, it was a really cool partnership where they um, were able to access data from the USDA um, with help from the Agree Coalition of which EDF is part. And, you know, we've always heard anecdotally from her saying, I've used these soil health practices for years. My, fi my field's held up better than my neighbors when we had this rain event. Well, now we're starting to get the studies in that are proving them right. Um, this is a really awesome study, and there are a few more that have come out, um, you know, a few years after the 2019 floods. And um, I think the next step and the big challenge is how do we integrate this into crop insurance policy? And then, um, Agriculture finance, this is really where I spend most of my time. And they've really been sitting on the sidelines. Um, farmers really depend on their lenders to run their businesses. They borrow money to buy land, to buy equipment, to finance their operating lines every year, to grow their businesses. Credit is the lifeline of, of agriculture. It helps it grow. Um, and Agricultural lenders, you know, share in the climate risks that their that their farmer clients face, you know, as their closest financial partners. Um, and so, you know, for the for the past five to six years, I've had hundreds of conversations with agricultural lenders to understand their role in um, financing climate smart agriculture. What are the barriers? How can they be more proactive in this space? And last year, we did the first ever um, climate risk and opportunities survey with 167 agricultural finance institutions um, around the world. And we did this with Deloitte. Um, and what we found, 87% of agricultural lenders see climate change as a material risk to their business. Just 24% 
significantly, significantly factor climate change into their decision making. That's a big gap between understanding a risk and acting upon it. And it's worse in the US. In the US, it's about 8% are factoring it into their decision making. But at the same time, nearly 60% of those lenders expect climate change to present opportunities for their business. So really, they're just at the very beginning of grappling with this challenge. I've spoken with, um, in the US, about 40% uh, of ag finances under the farm credit system, about 40% by commercial banks. Um, I've spoken with the farm credit group of 30 CEOs two times on these topics. And they are right now, you know, hiring chief sustainability officers, doing their first sustainability plans. They're at the very beginning of building capacity to be able to engage on this. But when they do, it's really gonna make a difference. We're starting to see largely from kind of smaller and nimbler players in this space, financial innovations emerge throughout the agricultural value chain. Um, I have the privilege to serve as Field to Market's um, co-chair of their Innovative Finance Committee. I just saw Shelby walk in, who was my original co-chair. Um, and so when Shelby and I started this, uh, this committee at Field to Market a couple years ago, we really wanted to understand what are the current financial innovations that are out there in this space. Um, and we came up with a really good list. We came up with 12 different blueprints uh, across these different categories of financial innovations that are supporting farmers to adopt more climate smart agriculture. Um, and all of these were either you know, in action or ready to go. These are not theoretical concepts. And so um, what we did from here um, is uh, we wrote a report outlining these. You can find it online. Um, then the Partnership for Climate Smart Commodities opportunity came out, and we turned it into a proposal. Field to Market was awarded $70 million to help expand these financial innovations. And the list of partners um, that are included in this grant are just like a true list of all stars. They include PCM. Um, they include Practical Farmers of Iowa. Um, they include the Intertribal Agriculture Council and Akiptan, which is a native community development financial institution. They're getting $15 million to expand the awesome work they're already doing on access to finance. Um, in native communities and add a climate smart lens. And the Federation of Southern Cooperatives, which is aiming to do something similar to Occupy, both address access to finance uh, issues for black producers with a climate smart lens. One other organization that's included in this um, uh, is Farmers Business Network. And I'm going to end with this example, specific example of a financial innovation in which EDF has taken part. So, been you know talking with lots of ag lenders, working with them, um, trying to um, convince them of you know why uh, they should act more proactively to finance climate smart agriculture. But really nothing is more convincing than an example in the marketplace that work and that farmers want to participate in. So uh, we collaborated with Farmers Business Network on the Regenerative Agriculture Financing Program. Um, its pilot year was $25 million. Um, what it is, it's a farm operating line. If farmers meet environmental standards for nutrient efficiency and for soil health practices, they get a half a percentage point rebate off the interest rate of, um, of their loan. When we launched this program, it was rapidly oversubscribed. This was FBN's fastest selling financial product ever. It filled up with 48 farmers across 18 states. And I wanted to kind of, you know, 
go under the hood with you all and show you um, the environmental standards that were included. And this was a challenge because we were aiming for something that was robust yet flexible and would allow farmers in a variety of geographies to participate. Um, the 18 states, I think, farmers from North Dakota to Georgia participated. So I think, you know, check on that. That was a success. We also allowed um, both early adopters of these practices and new adopters of these practices to participate. Now we're able to do that because FBN was not selling the environmental benefits that they generated. If they were, you know, working towards a net zero target or selling those credits, we would not have been able to include those early adopters, but it was great that we were for this. And so the nitrogen standard for this is based around some science um, that EDF scientists have been really involved in um, called nitrogen balance. It's basically nitrogen use efficiency, but you do the math a little bit different. You subtract instead of divide. Um, and what it gets you is a total excess nitrogen. So it's all the nitrogen applied to the crop minus the amount of nitrogen taken off by the crop. And what this does that's cool and is slightly different from NUE is it allows you to quantify nitrous oxide outcomes. So when we have sufficient data, we can actually quantify how much nitrous oxide these farms emitted and how much they reduced. And what our scientists found is that there's this little safe zone here. Um, when you're under, below the nitrogen balance safe zone, um, you're in risk of mining your soils for nutrients. When you're above the nitrogen balance safe zone, you're at risk of really losing excessive amounts of nitrogen to uh, both the water and air. So ultimately, Farmers signed up, that was a win. Farmers in different geographies also signed up, that was a win. And a couple months ago, we released uh, the full results of the pilot. The other cool thing about this project is that we've been able to be really transparent about the results. Um, and so what we found is that um, of the farmers who completed the data submission, all the requirements, 83% of them were able to meet the environmental standards and receive the rebate payment. Those who didn't, we were able to give them um, some information back on um, where, the, where the problem is. In most cases, it was over application of nitrogen to corn and some guidance on how they could be more efficient and hopefully win the rebate in a future year. Now, I just need to say, this is just about winning the rebate or not. Their operating line was always secure. This was not you know, endanger, endangering their underlying financing. On the, on the grounds of this success, FBN decided to double the program this year to $50 million. And they're gonna continue to expand in future years. Um, they both have some impact investors on board, um, as well as participating in that Climate Smart Commodities project. So you can see how these, you know, these specific example can work, but also how it builds upon partnerships and learning and knowledge from us and many others in this room to make these opportunities available to farmers. So to wrap up, um, I've shared the information, investment, and partnerships that I see in the landscape right now to make this climate smart agriculture moment last for a long time. Um, each person in this room, you know, has their own version of this and something to contribute. For our conversation tomorrow, I'm really excited to dig into those different perspectives and see what we can come up with together. So with that, thank you very much.